worship together. Stop. 
Amen. Well, we are very glad to have you here this morning. You can go ahead and take a seat. And in, in the back of the pew in front of you, as, as we are preparing for our Advent reading, you should see a card that says, Welcome Home. Okay? And we really do hope that this is home for you. But if you can, just grab that card. And if you have never filled it out, or if you need to update your information, or if you've been here a million times, fill that card out. You can drop it in to the offering plate as it's passed later. You can hand it to me or Josh. But we want you to know that we hope you find this as your home in, in Christian service. And I'm going to turn it over to the Elliot family who's going to have our Advent reading for the morning. Today we light the Advent candle that represents joy. In Luke 2, we have the exciting announcement of our Savior's birth. The gospel records, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God, the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Has someone ever come to you with really good news? Did you rejoice with them? Did you share in their excitement? Did you run to see what all the fuss was about? This story makes me think of the excitement shared when a mom-to-be tells a grandma-to-be. Did you get the ultrasound? Show me the pictures. We should have the same excitement as we experience the joy and celebration of Christ's birth and as we share the good news with everyone around us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this time of the year can just be so busy, so hectic, God. And we just pray that we feel your peace around us, God. We just want to search for what they were searching for back then, God. We just want to seek you in our lives, God. We just pray that you be with us today. Be with us for the rest of this season, God, and just help us stay focused truly on you and not let the busyness of life get in our way. Lord, we love you and we praise you, for it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we continue to worship. i yeah. 
Christ. God, we thank you that in this Christmas season we can look to that manger because it points to the cross. God, we thank you for what that baby means because he didn't stay a baby. And he grew and he was our sacrifice so that we could have a way to you. So as we think about Christmas, God, I pray that we would meditate on the cross. And I pray for Josh as he brings the message this morning, that you would use him, that distractions would be minimized, and that you would be glorified. We love you and we praise you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Amen. 
Listen, I hope that you are as excited to be here uh, this morning as I am. If you're a guest with us today, we especially want to welcome you. Maybe you came because a friend invited you. Uh, Maybe you came because uh, your kid is downstairs. Uh, We have about 70 children downstairs right now uh, hanging out with a lot of our workers, and they are um, uh, beginning just now. They are beginning uh, celebrating Finding Christ in Christmas. It's a new Christmas experience for our kids, and so we're very excited for for that this morning. Listen, why do we sing about the baby in the manger? You know, uh, the reality is, is that we live in a world full of distractions. There's so many things that pull our attention away from the real reason for Christmas. And sometimes we sing um, and it's meant to be more reflective. I was back uh, stage praying with our bands and uh, praise team before service. They said, listen, you're going to have to get up and you're going to have to be excited because, you know, it's a little bit lullaby-ish. Uh, going into the sermon. It said, it's okay. I've had a whole pot of coffee. All right. So I'm going to talk fast. You guys listen fast. We'll get through it. Um, But in seriousness, we think and we reflect and we sing about that baby in the manger because as Stephen just was praying, you know, he didn't stay a baby. That baby was God's gift of eternal life to all who would believe. He was God in flesh sent on a rescue mission for us who would call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. Have you ever been in need of rescue? Did you, have you ever been in a place where you needed to be rescued? Maybe you were a kid, you were lost in the woods. Maybe you were lost in the store and you were crying out mom or, or dad. Um, maybe before cell phones, if you're of that generation, you remember where you had to go on MapQuest and print out the map directions and hope that they were correct. And maybe you've been lost on the road, you needed to stop and ask for help. You know, as I was thinking about being rescued, I looked up some of the greatest rescues throughout history. Uh, I looked up and one of the ones that was at the top of the list was the Apollo 13 mission. You probably remember Tom Hanks in the movie saying, Houston, we have a problem as the oxygen tanks exploded and all of NASA had to figure out how to get these astronauts back home. Another one of those great rescue missions was, uh, it was actually called the Great Rescue. It was about 130 army rangers who rescued over 500 captives who were brutally beaten and marched in the Bataan Death March in World War II. A third one was about 12 boys, and this was just several years back, and their soccer coach who got trapped in a cave for 18 days during Thailand's monsoon season. Several others were coal miners stuck in a collapsed mine for 68 days, uh, ships sinking, an 18-month-old girl falling in a well and surviving for two days, a man stopping a train filled with dynamite that had caught fire and was uh, entering into a city down in Mexico. Great rescue missions. You know, I had kind of a a rescue moment uh, myself just a couple of uh, days ago. Uh, Asher and I, we were out and we had stopped by the church and we were playing catch with one of those, uh, not gloves, but where the ball kind of sticks to the mitt. And so we're throwing the ball back and forth. And I recognized that, you know, Asher being a six-year-old, he didn't always catch my throws. And I thought that I would play a trick on my six-year-old son. I know I'm a mean dad. That's just who I am. And so I take the ball and I throw it over my truck. And as the ball goes over the truck, he goes around to retrieve the ball and I decide I'm going to jump in the bed of my truck and I'm gonna hide from him, right? And so I hide from Asher. I lay down really, really quietly and he comes around the truck and I hear his voice, dad, dad. And then all of a sudden he gets a little bit more panic. He's like, dad, where are you? And so I pop out of the back of the truck laughing. And here's the thing. He looks at me and he says, dad, I didn't know where you were. And if you had left me, they were going to send me to one of those homes without parents. And, and I just had a five month old, uh, I have a five month old brother at home and I'm just getting to know him. It would have been awful to go to that home. So he was very distraught. Here's the thing. I thought it was a joke. Asher thought he needed rescued. The truth is, is that we all need rescued. That's what the Bible tells us. We need rescued from sin. We need rescued from despair. We need rescued from hopelessness. And in Micah chapter 5, we are going to hear from the prophet Micah about this rescue mission that God was going to send his son on. 
So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you know, if you'll turn to me, with me, to Micah chapter 5, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. And this is what the Word of God says to his people this morning. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephraim, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming is from old, from the ancient of days. Therefore he shall give to them or therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, and then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Now when the Assyrian comes into your land and treads in our places, our palaces, then we will rise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men, and they shall shepherd the land of Assyria with a sword." And the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrians when he comes into our land and treads within our borders. Let's pray. Father God, we do come to this passage this morning, over 700 years before the birth of our Savior. But let us not miss its promise to us 2,000 years after his death on the cross. The rescue mission that you planned, that you initiated, that you carried out is the rescue mission that we celebrate this morning. God, move in us today, your people, and we will give you praise. And all God's people said, amen. So we begin the setting of Micah chapter 5, and it, it's a lot like uh, what we experienced in Micah's chapter 1 through 3, that, that Israel's in a place of deep despair. They're in a place of great hopelessness. See, the book Micah was written between the years 735 B.C. and 700 B.C. And at this point in Israel's history, Israel has been broken into two. There was the northern kingdom uh, known as Israel, and there was the southern kingdom, which is often and referred to in scripture as Judah. In about 722 BC, so you can see right during the time that Micah is writing this book, 722 BC, Assyria is assaulting the northern kingdom of Israel. As a matter of fact, in 722 BC, King Sargon II, who was the king of Assyria at the time, completely falls the northern kingdom of Israel, and it looks like the southern kingdom is next. Now we find out in history and throughout scripture that the southern kingdom actually falls to Babylon in 586 BC by a king Nebuchadnezzar. But at this point, Israel doesn't know that. They're afraid. They are shaken to the very core. It seemed that there was going to be no stopping the Assyrians from doing the damage that they were doing. The people were going to be carried off and never seen from again. Israel and Judah likewise is in a place of great despair, great defeat, great hopelessness. And so the prophet Micah is writing into this. He's writing to the people of the northern kingdom. He refers to them earlier in his book as Samaria. And he's writing to the people in the southern kingdom, which he refers to as the city of Jerusalem. And in verse 1 of chapter 5, this is what he says. He says, go ahead and gather your troops. In the ESV, it says, muster your troops. Now, I just want you to hear exactly what Micah is saying when he says, muster your troops or gather your troops. You know, I talk a lot about being a dad. That's the experience that I have right now in this moment of life. I, I get the joy of being a dad, but I was also the oldest of three siblings. And there's a great difference between being a dad and being the oldest of three siblings. See, when you're a dad and you say to your son, you're so 
so strong. What you're doing is you're building up their self-esteem. You're building up their courage. You're wrestling with your son. My sons absolutely love to wrestle. Sometimes they'll sneak attack me, jump on my back, all of those type of things. And so we're wrestling. I'm like, oh, you're so strong. Now the truth is, is that I can defeat any of my sons, my five-month-old, hopefully, right? My six-year-old and my nine-year-old. It doesn't take a whole lot for me to defeat them, to overwhelm them, to pin them to the ground. Sometimes I like to do it just to prove who's the boss. But when you do that, you're wrestling with them and you're saying, you're so strong. You're building up their self-esteem. You're building up their courage in themselves. But when you're the older brother and you say, you're so strong, it means something entirely different, doesn't it? When you're the older brother and you look at your siblings, you're like, oh yeah, you're so strong. What you're really saying is, you're weak, I'm not, and I can take you anytime I want. See, that's what's happening here in Micah. Micah is going and he's looking at the people. He's looking at Jerusalem. He's looking at the southern kingdom. He goes, oh, you're so strong, not in the way that a father would do it, but in the way that an older sibling would do it. It was an insult to the people. In other words, what Micah was really saying to the people of Israel is, you and what army are going to handle this? You and what army are going to defeat the Assyrians? Go ahead, gather your troops. I'm going to wait right here because you don't have anything on the Assyrian armies. You cannot handle this by yourself. He goes on and he continues and the insults get a little bit worse. He says, oh yeah, you're so strong. You and what army? And then he calls them daughter of troops. Now this is in reference to Jerusalem. It was a place of prominence. It was a place of position. It was a city of great power and great wealth when he says daughter of troops. But this is really important because the way that Micah uses this reference is almost like he's saying, go ahead, run along, little lady, right? Nobody wants to be called little lady. This was an insult of insult. Y'all go ahead and gather your troops. I'm going to wait right here. Go on. See what you can do, little lady. Uh, We know that you cannot defeat the Assyrian troops. So Micah is laying out insult upon, upon insult. And then he moves from the city of Jerusalem to the king of Judah. He takes the insults from the nation to the person of the king. And what he says in verse one is he says, there's going to be a rod and it is going to strike the king's face or strike the face of the judge. This is where it gets really interesting because see, the king was the one who carried the rod. Oftentimes you see in a coronation where the king has the scepter, it's that gold staff with the crystal ball or, or whatnot at the top. It's, it's marvelous. And the king is handed that rod uh, signifying that he has power, that he has the authority, that he is the one that is responsible to rightly judge the nation. And so Micah uses this language of coronation to insult the king. He says, you're the one that is supposed to carry the rod. You're the one that's supposed to be strong. You're the one that's supposed to rightly judge the nation. You haven't done any of that. And instead of being the one with the rod, you are going to get smacked in the mouth. Uh, Psalm 72 gives us this language of coronation. In verse 1 and 2, it says, Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The problem was, and this is why Micah uses the word judge in this moment, is that the king had done none of that. The kings of Israel had grown wicked over time. They had turned away from God, and instead of being the ones that rightly judged. Instead of being the ones that carried the rod, now the rod was being used against them. The insults completely turned personal against the king. But this is what Micah is getting at in verse 1. And and we ought not to miss this, that Israel was in a hopeless position. That Israel was feeling completely hopeless without any sense of hope. The king was left with no reputation. The country was left with no realm. The people were left with no resolution. Israel was without hope. But here is where it takes a personal turn for us this Christmas. What about us? What about us this Christmas? Are we a people of hope? One of the things that I often refer to in Christmas sermons is that, you know, there's a sense of hopelessness that people struggle with around the holidays. Oftentimes, people feel hopeless during the holidays. Several weeks ago, the New York Times actually did an article on this. And this is a quote directly from the article. It says this, sometimes the holiday spirit just passes us by and that's perfectly normal. 
Holidays can come with feelings of hopelessness. A lot of people feel hopeless around the holidays because they've lost loved ones that are no longer there to celebrate the holidays with them. But a lot of people in our society, and this is referred to in the article, feel hopeless because of the social pressure that the holidays are often filled with. That there's social pressure to purchase so many things. That there's social pressure to feel and act cheerfully. And what that social pressure does is it leads to increased anxiety and depression. We, uh, there's actually been a term that is beginning to be coined uh, uh, about this. It's called Insta-Christmas. Maybe you have Instagram as one of your social media accounts. And, and Insta-Christmas is this idea that everything looks better on Instagram and on social media than it actually is in real life. One of the things that we do on Instagram, if you have Instagram, is we use, we use what's called a filter. In other words, in case your picture isn't pretty enough, in case your picture isn't cool enough, we're going to take that picture, we're going to use a filter, and it, we're going to make it look better so that you can get more likes, so that life can look better than what reality actually is. But here's the truth that I want to bring to you this morning, because it goes a lot deeper than just hopeless holidays. See, I think seasonal bouts of despair actually point to a much more pressing need. And here's our most pressing need that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what it says in Romans 3, 23. Uh, Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. In other words, because of our sin against a God who is holy and righteous, we deserve death. We deserve eternal separation from him. We deserve to be cast out of his presence and into the pit of hell. And Isaiah comes and caps that by saying the best we can do, even the best we can do, is as filthy rags before the holiness of our God. See, the hopelessness that we sometimes feel in the Christmas season, I believe, points to something a whole lot deeper. And like I said at the beginning, God was answering this. He was rescuing us from this, and we're going to get there in just a few minutes. We move from Israel's hopelessness. The second thing that we find in Micah chapter 5 is Bethlehem's promise. He says this, O you, Bethlehem of Ephraim, who are too little to be counted among the cities of Judah, But you, O Bethlehem of Ephraim, are too little to be counted among the cities of Judah. Listen, when we sing the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, little sums it up. Bethlehem was a city not too far, if you could call it a city, uh, not too far from Jerusalem. And we remember that uh, the prophet Micah had just talked about Jerusalem, this place of power, this place of prominence. That was now being ransacked by the Assyrians or feared being ransacked by the Assyrians. And then he's comparing it to, of all places, Bethlehem. Just to come clear with you, that's like comparing the city of Cincinnati with Bethel, Ohio. There's not a comparison other than proximity and the fact that they might cheer for the same sports teams. There's no comparison to the prominence and to the riches and to the marvelous buildings that are downtown in Cincinnati. There's no comparisons. There's no great American ballpark. There is no stadium where the Bengals play. There is no, you know, a basketball court. There's no UC that is out in Bethel, Ohio. All of these things, marvelous as they are, they're found in downtown Cincinnati. They are not found in Bethel. And so what Micah is doing here in this passage is he's saying, listen, you think you have it all together, you people in Jerusalem, but God is going to do something and you're not even going to come close to it. You're never going to guess where it's going to be. Listen, I have a family that grew up in a little small town of Utica, Ohio. If you know where that is, you are numbered among the very few, okay? See, I remember when my family, uh, my cousins and a lot of family grew up uh, up there. And, and I remember when the, the town got its first ATM, all right? That was a huge celebration. As a matter of fact, it's such a small town that at one point in Utica's history, there was a gas explosion that popped the 
sewer lids off the streets and they printed t-shirts, okay? That just tells you what kind of small town this was. That's the small town of Bethlehem. It's Podunk, Ohio. We should not miss this. Bethlehem is not a city like Jerusalem. And yet what it says to us is that God is the God who does. God is the God who uses the unexpected, the unassuming, the people and the places in the world to bring about his marvelous plans. I posted on social media just earlier this week This was this profound thought that just really overwhelmed me as I was studying this passage. That Bethlehem reminds us that the God who takes acorns and turns them into mighty oak trees is by no means limited by the size of our beginnings. The God who takes acorns and turns them into oak trees is not limited by the size of our beginnings. The God who uses simple, small, poor, and dirty towns like Bethlehem is the God who uses broken and sinful people like you and me. And that thought overwhelms me. Yes, Bethlehem is not like Jerusalem. And yet God did something bigger in Bethlehem than he ever did in the city of Jerusalem. But not only is, was it a city unlike the, the city of Jerusalem, but there was going to be a king that was going to be unlike Bethlehem's or Jerusalem's current king. See, the current king in Jerusalem was worldly. He was woefully inadequate in every single way. But what scripture does in the next few verses is it breaks down who this next king is going to be. He's not going to be worldly. He is going to be otherworldly. He's going to be heavenly. He's not going to be woefully inadequate. A matter of fact, what scripture records for us is he's going to be omnipotent. He is going to be all powerful. Jesus comes as the heavenly king, the rightful king. And what verse two tells us when it says, but you, O Bethlehem Ephraim, who are too littles to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, who is coming forth from the days of yore. Here's what he's saying. First off, is that this king that was coming was going to be the rightful king. See, the king that was sitting on the throne was the wrongful king. In other words, it wasn't that his lineage was wrong, but that his focus was wrong. He wasn't focused on God. But here comes a king who is in the lineage of David, whose focus would be completely on doing the will of God. As a matter of fact, that's what the gospels record for us, is that Jesus says, even at the moments where he was very near breaking, he says, not my will, but yours be done. This king that was coming was going to be the rightful king in the lineage of David with his eyes focused completely on Christ. But not only do the days of yore remind us that this king was hearkening back to the lineage of David, but it reminds us that this king was going to be eternal as well. He's not just the temporal king, but he's the eternal king. And he has come to carry out four specific things according to this passage. The first we find in verse 3. And in verse 3 it says this, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. That this king was going to come. And while the current king was losing the people of Israel, this king was coming to restore the people of Israel. In other words, this king was coming not just to bring the nation of Israel back to himself or back to the place, but he was also bringing all people throughout all the earth back to right standing with God. See, that's what Jesus does for you and me. He not only put the people of Israel back in the right place, but he brings you and me back to where we ought to be with God in right standing with God. In verse 4, he continues, and he's not just going to restore the people, but he's also going to shepherd the people. See, Micah chapter 5, verse 4 says this, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. In other words, that this king who was coming was not going to be a king that was concerned about himself. This king that was coming was not going to be a king that was concerned about building up his wealth. This king that was coming was going to be a king who lovingly shepherded God's people. 
Here's what you ought to be taking away from this. This king who is king over all the earth, because the Bible declares for us that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess on heaven and earth that he is king, that he is Lord, but don't miss it, he is loving. He's, he, he's not a worldly king, right? He's a loving king. That this King Jesus cares deeply for you and for me. Maybe that thought has left you. Maybe you've been struggling. What I want you to hear this morning is that Jesus loves you. That Jesus cares for you. That Jesus desires to restore you to relationship with God and to love you in your relationship with God. Verse 4 continues in this passage. Not only does he desire to shepherd his people, but he also desires to protect his people. It says this, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his is God and they shall dwell, get this, secure. See, the people of Israel at the time, they were not feeling secure. They were feeling anything but secure. They felt like their knees were shaking, that they were stand on, standing on, on shaking ground, but this king was going to protect them. Unlike the king who was sitting in Jerusalem at the time, this king was going to protect his people and this king still protects us today. What does he protect us from? Well, he protects us from sin. Yes, the wages of sin is death. We, re, we uh, repeated that verse earlier, Romans chapter 6, 23, but, but that's not the end of the verse. It says the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, for everybody who calls on the name of the Lord, we can be saved. We can be saved from sin. We can be saved from death. We can be saved from sin and, and shame. He protects his people. And then finally in verse 5, he wraps up who this king would be. And he says this, that this king was going to be a king who provided peace and hope for his people. Here's what it says in scripture. And he shall be their peace. This king that was coming was going to bring peace to Israel. And this king who came can provide peace for you and for me. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning, but our King Jesus provides peace. In the midst of mess, in the midst of calamity, in the midst of despair, our King Jesus wants to provide you with peace. In John 10.10, 10, it's one of my favorite verses because it's filled with this promise of hope. It says this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come, Jesus says, that you might have life and have it abundantly. Where's your peace this Christmas season? Where's your hope this Christmas season? Is it resting in Jesus? So yes, Israel was filled with hopelessness. And Bethlehem was promised. But let's bring it on forward to the Messiah's birth. The Messiah's birth. What scripture records for us is that the angel Gabriel appears to a virgin girl, a young girl named Mary, who was engaged to a man named Joseph. And the angel appears to Mary and he says, do not be afraid for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and bear a son and you will name him Jesus now, naturally, the girl was filled with all sorts of emotions that I can't even begin to imagine. She simply responds, how can this be? And the angel tells her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. And your relative, Elizabeth, who is barren and much older than you, as a matter of fact, much, much past childbearing years, she is now Pregnant, for nothing is impossible with God. Just stop there. Let those words sink in. Nothing is impossible with God. Maybe you need reminded of that this Christmas season. But the birth of the, the Messiah continues. 
As you can imagine, Joseph was filled with all sorts of emotions himself when Mary comes and says, hey, an angel appeared to me and I'm pregnant. That came as a surprise to me too. It certainly came as a surprise to Joseph. Now, Joseph was a godly man is what scripture tells us. And he decided that he was going to leave Mary, but he was going to do so as quietly as possible in order to not bring her shame. But as he rested, I imagine his mind was still spinning. But as he rested, the angel of God appears to Joseph as well. He tells Joseph not to worry about marrying Mary because what Mary had told him was the absolute truth. So Joseph goes and he does exactly what the angel tells him to do. He marries Mary, but the Bible records that he knew her not until after Jesus was born. In Luke 2, the story picks up. It says, In the days of Caesar Augustus, that was the one who was reigning over all of the Roman Empire, that Caesar had ordered a decree that all people from everywhere go to their hometown for a census to be taken. Now Joseph was of the lineage of David. And so Joseph goes to the city of Bethlehem. And as Joseph and Mary traveled to the city of Bethlehem, the time had come for the birth of Jesus. And so Mary gives birth to Jesus. She lovingly wraps him in swaddling clothes and she lays him in a manger for there was no room for them in the inn. That very same night in the very same region, There were shepherds watching over their flocks and the angel of the Lord appears before the shepherds and the glory of the Lord surrounds the shepherds and the angel says, fear not for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. After saying this, a multitude of angels appear before these same shepherds, singing and praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those with whom he's pleased. After the angels disappear, the shepherds look at each other, and they say, We must go see what we have just been told. And they find out that it was just as they were told. The baby was indeed found in the city of David, Bethlehem of Ephraim, who was too small to be counted among the cities of Judah. And he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and he was laying in a manger. And what the Bible records for us in this moment is that they praised God. They went away worshiping God and they went away sharing everything that they had seen and heard. I don't want you to miss the point of what's going on. I don't want you to miss what God is doing in the midst of hopelessness. The point is this, that God is not a God who left Israel in their hopelessness. And God is not a God who leaves you and me in our hopelessness as well. God made a plan. 700 to 735 years before the birth of Christ, The people of God knew the very city that the Savior was going to be born. As a matter of fact, at the time of Jesus, it was common knowledge that Bethlehem was going to be the place where the Messiah would be born. It came as no surprise to them, and yet they still missed it. I don't want you to miss it. God is not a God who leaves us in hopelessness. God made a plan And he painstakingly, and I mean that literally, he painstakingly executed his plan, even at great cost to himself, so that you and I could be rescued. So that you and I could be rescued from our sin. So that you and I could be rescued from our shame. So that you and I could be rescued from our death. At the very beginning, I told a story of about 130 army rangers who swooped into enemy territory to rescue 500 people, captives, from the Bataan Death March. The sad part of the story is that after the rangers swoop in and there was very little sacrifice, only a few of the army rangers uh, perished. But they get to this place where the people are held captive and they free them. 
except for some of the people were so sick or so fearful by this point that that they didn't want to leave their captivity. They were beaten, they were filthy, and they were starving. But they didn't want to leave that which held them, that which shackled them, that which imprisoned them. They had lost all hope and refused to turn to the ones who risked life and limb to save them and to restore their hope. I believe for somebody today, God is beckoning you. See, he's already executed the mission. He died on the cross for your sin. He desires to enter into your life to restore your hope. The question is, is will you leave captivity and respond to his call? As our praise team comes back up, you're going to have an opportunity to do just that. See, if you never trusted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, if you've never asked him for, to forgive your sins, the Bible records for us that today is the day of salvation because every day that we breathe is a day where we can cry out to Jesus. So the question is, Will you cry out to him this morning? For those of us who have already cried out to Jesus, this message should not be lost on us as well. What marvelous things our God has done. May we be like the shepherds who respond and worship and leave this morning telling everybody what Jesus has done for us. I don't know how God's leading you this morning. But however that is, I want you to know that there is time to respond, time to come to the altar, time to pray, cry out to him, time to turn to him, time to pray for somebody who he's put on your heart that needs to know the gospel, time to join with our church family because this is a place where you desire to worship and lead your family. There is time this morning as we sing to respond as God's leading you. Let's pray. Father God, we do come to you and we thank you for this message of hope. Undoubtedly in a room this large, there are people among us who are being filled this Christmas season with a sense of dread, with a sense of despair, feelings of hopelessness, feel insurmountable. And God, you do not desire to leave us that way. May we see you for who you are. May we be filled with your hope this Christmas. May we respond as you're leading us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Stand and sing with us. Oh, to Jesus I surrender.
listen as our ushers are coming forward. What we hope for you this Christmas is that you have experienced the power of Christ in your life, that you have been brought from a place of hopelessness to hope, that you have been brought from despair to joy, because this Christmas is about Jesus. Uh, Listen, uh, before we pray over our offering, let me simply say this. If you have not joined a D group um, and you desire to, there's a way to do that. That's our January discipleship groups are going to be kicking off. um, And you need to hit uh, on the mobile app that you want to be a part of one or you need to talk to me if you want to be a part of one because the time to register for those will come to a close very, very quickly. And then finally, let me just simply say this. Thank you so much, church family, for your generosity. Listen to this. 70 children are downstairs worshiping our king, celebrating Jesus, because you are a generous church. Thank you for giving, and thank you for making a difference in the lives of the people that come. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of our community. We are impacting people for Jesus because of your generosity. So thank you for giving. Ralph, will you pray for us? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today that uh, we could uh, come to church to to hear your word, to to sing your praise, and that um, all the children downstairs can hear about Jesus Christ. We just ask, Lord, that you would touch their lives as you have touched ours. Father, we now ask that you would bless this offering, that you would allow it to uh, spread your word throughout the world, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. came to see Mary. She was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're gonna have, what? I can't, I can't say good. Mary, you're gonna have a baby. I, you're gonna have a baby and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not gonna have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager, I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a new baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem, which was Joseph's old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> I don't know. A camel. Oh yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel and they asked the keeper um, for a place to stay. The keeper said, we have no rooms, literally no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place in here in Bethlehem hand that, that you can stay, stay is a staple. And then he just pointed the way and they followed. <laughs> when the shepherds were taking care of the sheep. Then they saw angels. The angel said, a new baby is getting born who is king of the Jews. The angel were singing. Glorious. And then the shepherds said, I think we should go there and meet him. The second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out a night. And then the wise men heard about it. And then a star appeared. We should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the barn. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, that I have at home. Some diapers, and <laughs> some wipes, and some milk, <laughs> some shoes, some Jordans. Gold, Frank, and Latimer. And I don't know how I would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped <laughs> because the room was very smelly. Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's gonna be our best friend. I love you, and you're the best baby I ever seen. There, I said it. (laughs) The new baby is gonna change the world.
more song together, let's all stay. Street. 